seeing his natural face in a mirror. For when he observes himself and goes away, immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it and is not a forgetful hearer but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. I had an interesting encounter several years ago, and it reminded me, reminded me of what a preacher in the U.S. had said. I arrived in New Orleans, and I had a speaking engagement about two hours away. And when I arrived at the airport, um, I called to find out where the people were who were picking me up. And I couldn't reach the, the person I wanted to reach. And so I just walked around the airport. I walked outside. I was looking in and out to try to find this person who was picking me up. After standing outside for a while, a car drove by, and the person stopped and said, are you Dave Burroughs? I said, yeah. So I, said, I asked him, I said, well, what happened? You know, y'all were supposed to be here an hour ago. He said, we were inside for over an hour waiting on you before the flight came, and we were, we were waiting on you. So I said, what happened? He said, well, you don't look like your picture. <laughs> And you know, <laughs> I tell you, and so in life, we have to ask ourselves the question, do I look like my picture? <laughs> you know, um, this place is called an honorable house. Does this house look like that picture? If you are a businessman, a politician, a doctor, a pastor, do you look like your picture? You know, people advertise certain things and say, this is who I am. But if you don't look like your picture, people will dismiss you and you will be discounted. You know, I'm not one to point fingers or lay blame, but what I believe that we are supposed to do is hold up the mirror and ask the question, do you look like your picture? So today I want you to think about your service, think about what you represent, and ask yourself the question, do I look like my picture? Mm -hmm. And if you don't look like your picture, then you need to make some adjustments because to say you are something or represent something and then people see something entirely different, that's a problem. And the word of God, the scripture that I read, tells us that the one who wants to please God needs to look like his picture. Yeah. Amen? Amen? Let's bow our heads together. Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you once again that we are able to gather here. We thank you for life, health, strength, soundness of mind. And as we deliberate today, we ask for your guidance, your direction, and we pray that everything would be done decently and in order. And at the end of the day, the interests of the people of the Bahamas would be served. And we thank you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Our Father, Father, be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give, give us this day our daily bread. Give us our trespasses. As we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thy name be kingdom, all in the glory, forever. Amen. Dr. Hubert Minnett, Peter Turnquist, Brent Simonet, Jasmine Bannister, 
Good morning, honorable members. Honorable members, when the business of this house suspended, the honorable member for Mount Moriah had reserved the floor. The chair now recognizes the honorable member for Mount Moriah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I thank certainly the Madam Whip for scheduling me for this morning. This morning, uh, oh, the last, thank you so much. This morning, I have another important event in addition to this contribution here this morning. And that event is to at least pay my respect to a young resident of the Mount Moriah constituency, young Donna Davis, the daughter of, of Rene Davis of the Millennium Gardens community, who died at the tender age of 18 years at her home unexpectedly. I had the opportunity to visit with her mother, who understandably is taking this uh, very hard, especially given the age of a daughter. But I take comfort in the fact that she trusts the only one who can bring peace to our souls, especially in times like this, the Almighty God. So we continue to pray for Ms. Davis and her family and the entire community of Millennium Gardens as they go through this difficult period in their lives and ask that God will continue to guide and strengthen them. Mr. Speaker, I deem it certainly a privilege to rise in this honorable house to make my contribution to this budget, the mid-year budget 2020-2021. And amidst the prevalence of COVID-19 pandemic at home, in the region and throughout the world, this year's mid-term budget debate, pink theme, resilience, in a crisis. It's certainly fitting, Mr. Speaker, as our nation adapts to this new norm while seeking new opportunities to redefine who we are as a people. Mr. Speaker, I want to thank the Almighty God for his grace, mercies, and goodness towards us and our nation. Indeed, as we reflect on where we came from and where we are now, we cannot help but to be grateful. It is only through God's continued blessing and the support of my wife, Stacy and our children, Joshua and Kai, that I am strengthened. Mr. Speaker, we are approaching four years since the great people 
of Mount Moriah constituency elected me to serve as their representative in this honorable house. For this, I remain eternally grateful for the love they continue to bestow on me and my family and the trust reposed in me as their representative. I wish to extend uh, Mr. Speaker heartfelt greeting to the Mount Moriah FNM executive team and council members, the associations of Yellow Elder Gardens, Millennium Gardens, and Stapleton Gardens, the National Neighborhood Watch groups that reside in those respective communities, Yellow Elder, and their leadership in Millennium and Stapleton Gardens, and our hard work and consultative team, members who continue to give unselfishly of their time and service to fostering a greater community. And I cannot forget, Mr. Speaker, it be, would be remiss of me if I fail to acknowledge some of the amazing transformation within the constituency as a result of individuals. When we look at the Mount Moriah Transformers Band and that partnership with the South Central Division of the Royal Bahamas Police Force and the Mount Moriah community, which would have led to the transformation of arguably the best youth band in the Commonwealth of the Bahamas. Mr. Speaker, I often boast about the invitation extended to that band under the directorship of Assistant Superintendent Campbell and the support of Chief Superintendent Mark Barrett. The invitation extended to that band a few years ago by the McDonald's Thanksgiving Day Parade committee members in Chicago. And it's similar to the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade. And, to and Mr. Speaker, to see young Bohemians who would have never had the opportunity to perform downtown in a major city at a major parade and experiencing the snow and cold weather for the first time did something to me. And to watch them on a major television network, WGN. And now many of these young persons are using music as a springboard to further their education through scholarships, to better themselves by joining organizations like the Royal Bahamas Police Force, Defense Force, and to assist in the development of even younger persons. And so kudos to them. I also, Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker would like to acknowledge there are so many persons I can, Mr. Jameen Williams and his group, the Immortals, which is a B group, which was recently started. And the work that they are doing throughout the community of Mount, uh, Mount Moriah, throughout the constituency of Mount Moriah, but principally the community of Yellow Elder. And Mr. Williams, and his team are doing some amazing stuff, despite the fact that we were not afforded the opportunity to experience John Canoe last year and this year due to the pandemic. And so kudos to persons like them, the leaders in Stapleton and what they're doing in respect to reducing crime and working with the police and Mount Mar and Millennium Garden and in Stapleton Gardens, there, there's so much going on. Um, and there are just so many persons to thank and what they're doing unselfishly to bring change 
to their communities and by extension, the constituency as a whole. You know, Mr. Speaker, I had a conversation last week with the Minister of Education. And it was important, it was a very important conversation, Mr. Speaker, and he was excited to, to hear about it, actually. Because through my canvassing of the constituency, one of the things that often hit to my core is when I get the opportunity to engage persons of all ages, be it a little child playing on the park or a young person walking throughout the community or a senior citizen sitting on the porch enjoying the sunset. But while walking through Yellow Elder last week, I got an opportunity to meet another bright mind, Yellow Elder, and uh, I can't stop talking about certainly this individual, uh, Mr. Raphael Brennan, young man, no more than maybe 16, 17. And like me, he growing up in a household, not large, very humble beginning. But what struck me is when I met this young man that evening and he had a bundle of paper in his hand. And his parents were there, they were all standing on the porch. In Yellow Elder at their home. And he had handed me the stack of paper. And I discovered, Mr. Speaker, that he was a student at St. Andrew's School with a GPA just short of four points. Mr. Speaker, The future of this nation is secure. We have to find more persons like Raphael Brennan. And we have to do whatever we can as a people, in this case as a government, to ensure that there are no impediments to their passage through life because they are the key to our future. And we must invest in them. And the conversation I had with my good friend, brother, the member for South Beach, the Minister for Education, because this young man had had scholarships from schools all over the US but he needs a little helping hand. Can you read a receipt? The minister assured me that it will happen. Absolutely. But Mr. Speaker, that is what this government is all about. That is the reason why this government continues despite the challenges of Dorian and COVID-19, to invest in programs that will release the shackles of a behemoth, that will release the dependency of behemoths to rely solely on the member of parliament begging and pray, but to move from this position of dependency more to empowerment. That's why we, we are working assiduously to create new entrepreneurs, right? To build this economy 
to set this country or this nation on a path for an even better future. That is what it's all about. So the, to the people of Mount Moriah, as your representative, I am very aware of the struggles you continue to face during this time. Be assured that your member of parliament will continue to commit to do all that I can to ensure that you are not forgotten. To the people of Mount Moriah, you have my word on that. Mr. Speaker, oh. last year when our administration tabled our 2019-2020 midterm budget, we did so in the aftermath of Dorian, which impacted the lives of thousands across Abaco and Grand Bahama respectively. respectively. The storm remains the most powerful, powerful tropical cyclone in Bahamian history. We acknowledge the resilience and determination of, of Abaconians and Grand Bahamians who remain in the recovery phase as they work toward some degree of normalcy. We are also mindful that much work in rebuilding remains for both government and the private sector. Mr. Speaker, following the devastation of Dorian in 2019, we ushered in 2020 with much anticipation for national growth and development. None of us could have predicted what lie ahead in 2020. Almost a year later, communities throughout our nation and around the globe continue to grapple with the common enemy the COVID-19 pandemic. This mid-year budget is taking place amidst 2.5 million COVID deaths worldwide, of which 180 occurred right here in the Bahamas. Untold damages to international markets as the IMF predicts global GDP to be 6.5 percentage points lower than the pre-COVID projections of January 2020. Adverse stress on healthcare, education, and social services sectors. The exacerbating situation has resulted in the deepest historic recession in our nation's history, as reflected with great impact on businesses, jobs, per capita income, and govern government revenues. And the contraction in economic activity which is a historic high with exerting pressures on expenditure. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, as elected officials, we have a sworn obligation to be at the front and ever mindful of the individual and collective needs of the people we are elected to serve. Government's first duty is to protect the people. Our national response to COVID-19 has attracted the, the attention of the world and has become a model on how to do it right. This, Mr. Speaker, despite what sometimes may appear to be insurmountable challenges in the fight against this pandemic. Mr. Speaker, we have injected considerable financial and human capital resources in essential public services to ensure we maintain our socioeconomic construct. And to date, we have invested over 10 point $2 million to support health and safety policies, to save lives, contain the spread of the virus, and support the gradual reopening of our economy. We have increased social services to support 85,000 unemployed individuals. We have provide food, provided food assistance to 72,000 households through the National Food Distribution Task Force. NIB has paid $24 million in contributions. Social services distributed $9 million in food vouchers assistance and offered $44 million in tax credit and deferrals to support the payroll for $14,000 for the private sector. Mr. Speaker, ours is a caring government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, in light of the above, the, I, the IMF, predicts that the Bahamas will have a 5.5% growth rate by the end of 2021 and a 4.2% in 2022. 
Mr. Speaker, I say to those most affected, our government led by the honorable member from Kalani is one who cares about you and the future of our nation. I know that the journey has been arduous and filled with much uncertainty. This is expected given what we have had to face in recent times. But rest assured that in 2017, you had reposed your trust on the future of this nation in the hands of a government who clearly understood at the time of coming into office the dire state of our nation and the measures that had to be undertaken to restore stability and, and the good name of this nation, our beautiful Bahama land. Mr. Speaker, imagine, if you will, if the side opposite were in office during what arguably is the most challenging period in our country's history. No one imagined that. If they had issued, if they had issues managing a category one hurricane, how do you think they would have fared with Doria? You see, Mr. Speaker, talk is cheap. Money buys land. But the track record is there to show. Imagine, Mr. Speaker, if the side opposite with the government and had to deal with a pandemic like the COVID-19. They have been very critical of our approach. Yet the world marvels. Mr. Speaker, as the minister with responsibility for national security, I am always proud of the efforts of the men and women in law enforcement and responding to crisis. And our team in office can be considered one of the most, our term in office, I'm sorry, can be considered one of the most challenging in our nation's history. In 2019, we were devastated by Dory, and the men and women of law enforcement made the sacrifices to leave their families, to travel to the impacted areas and provide assistance to their brothers and sisters on Grand Bahama and Abaco from months on end on rotation. Mr. Speaker, the rotation continues today. This ensured that safety and security were maintained and that the residents of those islands could begin returning their lives to some degree of normalcy. As if Dorian was not enough, we were impacted by COVID-19 the following year. Again, the men and women of law enforcement worked on rotation to ensure that the emergency orders were being adhered to. Mr. Speaker, it would be remiss of me if I failed to pay respects to all of those families in our nation who would have been impacted in some way by the pandemic, those who have lost loved ones, their jobs, and yet others who continue to suffer from the side effects brought on by COVID-19. I would also like, Mr. Speaker, to extend best wishes to our former Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Hubert Ingram, who himself is recovering from COVID-19. Mr. Speaker, we are approaching four years in, our, in office, and our objectives for safety and security are progressing according to our government's plan. Some of our accomplishments include the passing legislation to facilitate the National Crime Intelligence Agency, the passing of legislation to bring greater parity among law enforcement agencies, investing in best of breed technology in our fight against crime, including Shot Squatter, Marcos Alert, CCTV drones, body cam, and dash cam, decentralization of the RBDF to better serve all in the Bahamas, the establishment of the National Neighborhood Watch Council to improve police community relations, improving the physical environment for our law enforcement officers, improving living and educational spaces for inmates at the Department of Correction, working towards food independence at the Department of Correction, elevating training for all levels in law enforcement by partnering institutions such as the University of the Bahamas and the Georgia 
Internal Law Enforcement Exchange at Georgia State University, modernizing the voters registration process to include a permanent register and making provisions for biometric voters card, recognizing, reorganizing the rehabilitation of offenders unit to expunge the records of ex-offenders, laying the groundwork for the rehabilitation of offenders uh, through the Citizen Security and Justice Program, facilitating the, modernization, the modernizing of the judicial system by digitization and integrated case management system through the CSJP. Regulations have been laid to establish the sexual offenses registry, which will be piloted before the end of this fiscal period. These are just some, Mr. Speaker, of the achievement of this government on the crime and safety. As a matter of fact, Mr. Speaker, if you were to look at what we would have promised in our manifesto on the crime and security, the only outstanding thing remains is the establishment of an independent forensic lab, to which, Mr. Speaker, we have already established a committee and looking at how that can be achieved, possibly through a PPE. And so very shortly, we will be making a presentation to cabinet to see if we can continue to push this forward. Mr. Speaker, the 2020-2021 fiscal period continued. We continue to work and the, the work of my ministry, which was allocated some 247,300,823 dollars of the total 217,043,823 dollars was allocated to recurrent expenditure and 30 million dollars to capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, I now present a mid-year review for the agencies under my remit, and I begin first with the Royal Bahamas Police Force. Mr. Speaker, allow me from the outset to reaffirm our government's commitment to making the Bahamas an even safer place for all to live and work and move about freely. Since, Mr. Speaker, the George Floyd ultimate death in the United States in May of 2020. The global law enforcement environment is being reimagined and redefined. The role of police officers has been catapulted to the front, the forefront of the international conversation, with some calling for sweeping changes within policing agencies. Consequently, Mr. Speaker, this paradigm shift is global law enforcement means that nations across the globe must now reassess and redefine the role of policing within, within the global change construct. Mr. Speaker, I have always contend that any true definition of policing must have as its emphasis, its basis, the role of the community. While the George Floyd incident in the United States occurred within a different context, the potential impact of its fallout in our policing environment is not lost on our administration. As we continue to mold and expand our national security strategy for the future, we will be exploring how members of the public can play a more meaningful role in the policing of their community and this nation as a whole. Mr. Speaker, crime continues to trend downward. However, now is not the time to raise the, the victory flag and put away our battle shield and armor. We must remain steadfast and focus on our ultimate goal, a crime-free Bahamas. This battle requires an holistic and long-term strategy. It is a protracted one and one that we are willing and are committed to. Our government is resolved to engage in the continued fight against crime with the full arsenal of resourcefulness. Our emphasis remains on conducting research that gathers and analyzes data to discover the root causes 
and remedies for mitigating criminal behavior. Mr. Speaker, for the 2020-2021 fiscal year, the Royal Bahamas Police Force was allocated some $127,296,337. Recurring expenditure accounted for some $122,268,807 and $5,027,530 for capital expenditure. Mr. Speaker, according to the police force, for the year ending 2020, overall crime decreased by some 16% compared to 2019. Significant decreases were observed in a number of serious offense categories, including murder, which declined by some 23%, armed robbery, which declined by some 41%, and attempted rape, which declined by some 38%. It is not lost on us, Mr. Speaker, that rape increased by eight between 2019 and 2020. By eight, the number eight, by 16%. In 2019, we had 43, and in 2020, we had 50. So we can expect, therefore, Mr. Speaker, that during this year, the Royal Bahamas Police Force will be placing particular emphasis on that category of crime that is of great concern and should be to all of us. Mr. Speaker, property crimes also declined by some 15%. This includes housebreaking, which declined by some 13%, stealing, from a vehicle which declined by some 32% and stolen vehicles which declined by some 19%. Mr. Speaker, we continue to see significant decreases in property crimes throughout this country. And that is due in part, and I continue to say this, but we will be uh, commissioning or conducting studies to further prove what I am asserting is that with the establishment of the National Neighborhood Council and the work that they're doing, we are beginning to reap the results of that. And I say, Mr. Speaker, when I look at my constituency, the constituency to which I represent, and look at the innovative work that's being done and Stapleton and Millennium Garden in Yellow Elder Garden being led by the citizenry, people residing in those communities who are making a profound difference. Just recently, Stapleton would have, would have had a meeting with the press. They actually went over their crime stats in respect to housebreaking and stealings and everything else. And what they were doing in conjunction with the South Central Policing Division of the Royal Bahamas Police Force to further reduce those numbers. And so to LaCale Johnson, the president, and, and Hutting, and Carlos Carey and Yellow Elder and what they're doing and their team, and Jason Fitzgerald and Millennium Gardens and his team, and throughout this nation, led by Chairman Kino Wong, who continues to work and lead the NNWC, we can expect to see even greater things in the future, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, the charts, and we should be observing from um, the parliamentary channels, you should be the persons who are viewing should be seeing these charts popped up as I speak. But the charts clearly indicate that during the last four years of our administration, crime has been on an overall downward trend starting in 2017 since taking office. 
and the chart will reflect that. Not only does this mean that we are onto something or, or, on, or on the right track, it also means that our four-prong approach of conceptual leadership, technical investment and technology, complemented by professional development to support the scene and good governance, undergirded with fiscal responsibility and integrity are indeed working. There are those on the side opposite who continue to speculate and provide their own unsubstantiated commentary with no empirical basis as to why crime under our administration continues to trend downward. But the good thing, Mr. Speaker, is, is this. It continues to trend downward. While that may be, while that may be so, I contend, Mr. Speaker, however, we can't deny the fact that the downward trend is due to good government policies combined with <laughs> combined with effective strategies executed by the hard-working men and women of law enforcement. <laughs> we fail to give the men and women of law enforcement their credit. We always, and this is this is this has become typical of the side opposite. We always like to find some other means to say why crime continues to trend down. I'm not saying that we won't have increases from time to time, um, but the fact that we're on that downward trend, something is working, but there will be peaks, all right? Uh, and we will have to find the answers to, to those and make the necessary just adjustments as policing is a very dynamic profession. Mr. Speaker, permit me, if you will, to share a little on how other jurisdictions fed published report by the FBI for the first six months of 2020 indicates that murder and non-negligent homicide rose by 15% in the USA compared to 2019. So they were in COVID too. They still are. They had shutdowns and lockdowns in certain states and all that too to try and manage the spread of this. But yet their numbers increase. So hence why it's important to rely on study. In the Bahamas, the opposite has occurred. Mr. Speaker, the police force has also been successful in reducing the number of illegal firearms on our streets. According to the 2020 statistics, a total of 279 firearms and 4,044 rounds of ammunition have been seized. These firearms include 214 pistols, 25 revolvers, 21 shotguns, and 19 high-powered rifles, such as the AK-47 assault rifle. We are grateful that the police are ridding these types of weapons off of our streets, as they are more often than not the weapon of choice in homicides and other violent crimes. Mr. Speaker, closely associated with firearms and homicides are drugs. And again, this remains top priority for the police force. Drug seizures for the year also reflected successful interdiction efforts as a total of 4,301 pounds of marijuana, 1,000 505 marijuana plants and 116 pounds of cocaine have all been seized. A total of 1,244 persons responsible for these drug offenses were arrested, with 1,092 of them being subsequently charged. Mr. Speaker, while our government feels good about these successes and the direction we are headed, it is not lost on us that there is, however, a significant amount of work ahead for all of us. Mr. Speaker, I turn to police technology. Our effectiveness to prevent and detect criminality is contingent on how well 
we harness technology to remain ahead of those who seek to perpetrate crimes against us. Technological development is intrinsic to our everyday life and the future of crime fighting. However, Mr. Speaker, I should note that in light of the COVID-19, we sought to renegotiate terms with our vendors to ensure that we were able to avoid any disruption in the procurement of these technologies in the best interest of law enforcement and the people of our nation. Mr. Speaker, the government of the Bahamas, our government, has shown a strong commitment to the Royal Bahamas Police Force in its efforts to tackle crime by investing in technology that is serving the Bahamian public and leveraging good benefits. To date, there has been a procurement of 200 body-worn and 200 DAS cameras, and the program went live in August of 2020. Mr. Speaker, the systems are attached to officers in the mobile patrol unit, the flying squad, and the rapid response unit. These are persons who are on the streets engaging daily with members of the public. To date, 120 body-worn cameras have been deployed in operational command and 20 at the Cable Beach Police Station. The remaining 80 are being upgraded with the necessary specs while officer training is ongoing. And these technologies are being supported, Mr. Speaker, by policies that governs its use. Mr. Speaker, for the DAS cam, 18 have been fully installed and the remaining systems are awaiting vehicular upgrades and training before they can be added to the arsenal of police technology. To date, almost 4,000 recordings, almost 4,000 recordings have occurred with the DAS camera technology. So it proves that it is working, Mr. Speaker. We are a government of transparency. Of the amount, one request was made for footage to aid in a police complaint and one request to aid in a police investigation. These investments are worth every single dollar as they bring about a greater degree of accountability, improve the transparency of the police force, and, and it mitigates against any complaints against police officers and bring those officers who are acting contrary to policy and the law to the forefront and to justice. This technology demonstrates our government's commitment to bring transparency and accountability to all areas of law enforcement. Mr. Speaker, shot water technology allows the police to receive an instant notification on their cell phones and other issue devices showing the exact location of gunshots when they occur. Our investment is reaping dividends by aiding in the quick response of officers to reported gunshot incidents in 2020. The police responded to 1,052 gunshot reports. 44% of 463 gunshots were confirmed by shot spotter detection, which in turn resulted in 13 arrests where police officers were dispatched to investigate these gunshot detectors. So imagine, Mr. Speaker, 44% of 463 gunshots were confirmed by shot spotter. And shot spotter is only located on select areas of the island because we wanted to see whether first it was a good investment. But this, the evidence presented here today, Mr. Speaker, yeah, there is no question that it is a good investment. This is a significant percentage given the fact that short, short spot, as I said, sensors have not been installed all over New Providence. But we're gonna have to start looking at where we can install it uh, and whether there are areas in Grand Bahama um, and other places that we're investigating, whether that will be worth the investment. Mr. Speaker, to further pinpoint hotspot areas, New Providence was divided into two areas for monitoring purposes, including the eastern and western areas. 
The Western area, as highlighted, and those who are watching by way of the parliamentary channel should be seeing these clusters uh, on the slides. The Western areas, as highlighted and red, shows the highest number of gunshots compared to the Eastern area, as highlighted in blue. The difference between the two areas suggests that about 120% more shots were fired in the Western area compared to the Eastern area. Mr. Speaker, these technologies provide responding units with the shooter's position, speed and direction of travel, which are all useful information to locate shooting suspects after they have fled a crime scene. Mr. Speaker, I like, often like to tell the story of a suspect who, after robbing a hard-working woman returning from work to her home. He left with a bag in his hand and decided that he wanted to celebrate, and so he started to fire off his gun in the air in celebration. Well, that's what, that's what triggered the police. And the police responded to that almost immediately. And the subject, the subject decided to engage the officers upon seeing them, which resulted in an unfortunate outcome for the, for, the sub, for the subject. And so it brings me to this very critical point, Mr. Speaker, that police officers are trained to maintain law and order in this nation. Wherever the, it is found, that a police officer is acting inconsistent with the laws of this nation and the policies of his organization or agent, he or she will be dealt with to the fullest extent of the law. But after having said that, Mr. Speaker, I would have said earlier that firearms are the weapons of choice. We are no longer in the 70s, 60s, where you get into a fight, you throw rocks and bottles. We are, we are in an era where some in our nation continues to defy authority and to take on police officers. <laughs> as if they are acting out a scene in a movie. Mr. Speaker, no one likes to see anyone shot. And every shooting deserves a thorough investigation. <laughs> and wherever an officer is at fault, he or she must suffer the consequences. But Mr. Speaker, I cannot say that if the duty of a police officer is to ensure that the laws of this land is upheld, and he or she is confronted with misguided individuals who feel that they are empowered to take on law enforcement with AK. 47 weapons of that time to take on trained individuals who were sworn to protect us, then they are doing it at their own peril. And so I send a warning out, Mr. Speaker, to all of those young men in particular who feel so emboldened that by carrying a handgun or an assault rifle puts them on top of the world. Please, please reconsider and rethink and think before you act. 
because you will not succeed. Mr. Speaker, this technology provides responding units with shooters position, as I said before, directions. Also, commanders will use the analysis to devise feasible strategies to counter such activity within their respective areas. So Sharp Sparta is reaping tr tr tremendous uh, dividends uh, for law enforcement. Mr. Speaker, the expansion of the CCTV by 507 cam cameras under this government is well on the way. And over 200 high quality cameras have been installed throughout New Providence to augment existing technology. The system went live in July of 2020 with the use of smart technological capabilities, including license plate recognition, facial recognition, and time till zoom to capture evidential information in real time. Since the establishment of the CCTV, Mr. Speaker, there were 435 requests for CCTV footage to aid in police investigation. investigation. Overall, Mr. Speaker, footage aided 259 investigations, representing a 60% fulfillment rate. Mr. Speaker, in its continued effort to monitor high-risk persons in our society, the government and our government will introduce very shortly, because we, had, we would have laid those regulations last year, but we will introduce very shortly the Sexual Offenses Registry. A lot of work is now taking place behind the scene to make that a reality. This registry will impose reporting obligations on sex offenders, and so this will help us in reducing um, the high incidences of, of rape, especially in our country, thereby providing the police and the Bahamas Department of Corrections with up-to-date information to reduce reoffending by providing notification of residents, conviction lo uh, location, photo ID, and aliens to, to the public. A pilot program of the registry we are shooting to launch um, sometime this quarter, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, on February 17th or last month, the Prime Minister officially opened a uh, new state-of-the-art real-time crime center. Since its introduction in 2005 in New York City, the real-time crime centers have mushrooms across progressive law enforcement agencies. According to researchers, our real-time crime centers represent the future of crime fighting. Mr. Speaker, I am pleased to share that the future of crime fighting is here in the Bahamas. As a matter of fact, we are leaders in the world. Because what we intend to do in that real-time crime center, you're not going to see it anywhere right now, this world over. I'll speak to that shortly. The goal is to support frontline officers in engaging in purposeful action while responding to crime in real time with active information on their fingerprint, on their fingertip to direct their decision. This center will be responsible for integrating all of the acquired technology, which will result in better management and execution, including markers and alert. So to my brother, Mr. Speaker, the member for Exuma and Ragged Island, who during his contribution would have mentioned the acquisition of the drone. As I continue to say, Mr. Speaker, we're not talking about drones you purchase at Walmart. Or target. We're talking about law enforcement graded drones, smart drones. And so, what you can expect to see, Mr. Speaker, in the not too distant future, because we're getting there, we're now engaging in training and thing of that sort, but I'll come to that, is that the way the real time crime center will work is that a gunshot goes off in Camp Road, the smart cameras should be able to pan to where that shot is coming from. But it also sends a message to that drone, wherever that drone is located, the nearest drone. And that drone will automatically take you to the scene of that shot. 
and the officers in the real time crime center will be able to direct and better manage the thing. We're on the cutting edge of technology, not for, not for technology's sake. But all of these acquisitions will be supported by research. When we came into office as a government, we said this. We're not just going to invest in technology because it sounds good and it looks good. We're investing in technology because it works. And it addresses our needs and concerns here in this nation. That is the approach that we have taken as, this, as, as the government. Mr. Speaker, the manpower audit of the 2018 audit of the Royal Bahamas Police Force kind of set out what was needed. And the force needed to enlist at the time the audit came out some 791 constable to achieve its appropriate starting level. Since coming into office, our administration has engaged some 406 new police officers. In 2020, 135 new police officers were recruited, 100 in New Providence, 35 in Grand Bahama. The Grand ba behavior of recruits graduated in June of 18, 2020, and the New Providence, July 2020. They're all performing frontline police duty and we wish them the very best during their careers. Mr. Speaker, we are seeking to recruit some 385 new police officers, of which we hope to enlist 150 sometime before the next fiscal period, providing that the health and safety environment permits. To complement the dynamic and constantly changing field of law enforcement, the professional development of serving officers is essential. Research suggests that there is a positive correlation between job performances at all ranks of law enforcement and, ed and educated officers. In 2020, Mr. Speaker, 2,934 persons were trained, the most in the history of the Royal Bahamas Police Force, including 2,548 police officers, 135 Bahamian recruits, 19 recruits from the Turks and Caicos Island, 114 correctional officers, 24 custom officers, 31 immigration officers, 16 defense officers, 20 security officers, 25 civilians from the National Neighborhood Watch Council. The professional development courses at the police college includes modular modules in customer service, justifiable force and harm, combined agency intelligence, defensive training, driving, information technology, and the list goes on. Mr. Speaker, we continue to put the needs and concerns of our law enforcement officers in the forefront in the context of 21st century policing and law enforcement technology practices. Adequate facilities for law enforcement are equally important. And this is near and dear to us, Mr. Speaker, after coming to office in 2017, extensive assessments of police stations were conducted and many of the facilities were deemed inadequate to meet the current demand for services. And so former Commissioner Ferguson embarked upon uh, a significant renovation schedule and that has been taken on now by Commissioner Rolls. There is a significant amount of work left, left to do, Mr. Speaker. Uh, we, we clearly understand that, but as was indicated uh, by the Prime Minister, noted by the Prime Minister during his remarks at the opening of the real-time crime center, that things will happen for the police force, for our law enforcement officers. For the police force, the corrections department, the defense force, and I know my colleague, uh, and immigration will be speaking shortly and custom. Mr. Speaker, so the, our administration sought to provide appealing facilities that are functional to modern policing practices. 
To date, nine police station facilities have been completely renovated at a cost of 200 and that bounced me. I know you 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 made uh, you made Exuma feel happy. Exuma started to celebrate. He's the only man here from the other side, you know. He's the only man here from the other side. Where are you the colleagues? Uh, Mr. Mr. Speaker, you know, Mr. Exuma would certainly like to see me take my seat, but I'm finished with him. I'm finished with him. I, I, I think this is a good pause to say um, how, how I would miss my, my good brother from South and Central Andrews. We have enjoyed a really great relationship. The hometown boy has always been an upstanding man of, of character and always a great, thank you so much. Uh, oh yeah, oh, he's our, oh yeah, he's a hometown boy. Thank, thank you so much, thank you so much, my brother. And so, um, I don't know if Exum will want to give us a little update on that, but um, but we wish him well. Um, I, I sent him a note because I consider him a friend, and I wish uh, he and his family the very best, and said, I ask God to continue to guide and strengthen him as he continue his sojourn through life. But it's good to see you you're alive, Exuma. I'm coming back to you, though. <laughs> I also want, Mr. Speaker, to mention that all, I know Mr. Du Exuma, Exuma miss him too. He don't agree with that. No, 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 no. He loved the hometown boy, the man from Southern Central Andrew. I know, I know if you leave it up to Exuma, he, he'll have him back at some point. I also want to mention all of these renovations were completed, were completed by skilled police officers of the maintenance section. So our police officers and defense force officers and correction officers can do some amazing things. And I think that these officers deserve a round of applause. Let's give it to them. Why they like the one? Mr. Speaker, upcoming capital projects for the second half of the fiscal year will include six police stations throughout the Bahamas. It, it is our administration and intention to continue uh, this strategic approach to improving the working condition. And we are cognizant of the fact that as a result of during our losses in Abaco and um, Grand Bahama that we're seeking to address uh, uh, facilities there for the police under the defense force. No islands will be left out as we strive to create an environment that is conducive for growth and development. Mr. Speaker, vehicles uh, are a critical uh, concern. Vehicles are a capital, a critical capital asset, which have a direct and significant impact on the Royal Bahamas uh, Police Force and all of our law enforcement agencies, as a matter of fact. Bahamians can now see and feel and touch the $5.9 million investment and vehicles for police officers, from the Dodge uh, Chargers to the Segways at the airport. Now you see the officers at the airport, they now are accessible. They can get around, they can move through and engage and provide a more friendly uh, look. This is, this is the approach that our government uh, is taking. And certainly Jeep for the family islands to, to navigate those very tough terrain. But um, my good brother, here is making that very difficult for Michael because he's paving the roads. He's paving the roads on all the islands. They can need Jeep soon. They need more luxury vehicles for uh, <laughs> Michael because we are delivering, Mr. Speaker. Talk is cheap money by land. We are delivering. Okay? Mr. Speaker, the last four years was truly historic for the Royal Bahamas Police Force. There has been a dramatic shift in policing in a relatively short period of time, notwithstanding the strain that the COVID-19 has placed on police officers and other frontline officials. 
the force is more motivated, more inspired, and more enthused about going above and beyond. And I see officers every day, be it police or defense force or correctional officers. And while, yeah, I mean, there will always be issues uh, that, that are in need of addressing. But the fact that we are listening uh, means a lot and things are getting done. I would like to, to thank the commissioner and his executive team and um, all uh, rank and file of the Royal Bahamas police force and of course to the civilians, we can't forget them, for the work that they continue to do despite the challenges that they face. May God continue to bless them and guide them. Mr. Speaker, I now move to the Royal Bahamas Defense Force. Mr. Speaker, I now shift my focus to the Defense Force. According to George Washington, to be prepared for war is one of the most effective means of preserving peace. It is our administration's goal, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the Royal Bahamas Defense Force has the necessary resources devoted to maintaining its readiness and capabilities to defend our sovereignty. Mr. Speaker, the Defense Force's operations, like many other security forces, were impacted by the COVID-19 pandemic. However, despite the challenges, my ministry continued to accord the highest priority to executing transformative strategies within that agency. Emphasis is being placed on exploring a variety of security systems, operating concepts, and force structures. The goal is to identify the appropriate means to meet the emerging challenges nationally, regionally, and internationally. Exploit any opportunities which may arise and eliminate those uh, approaches that are not conducive to success. Mr. Speaker, for the fiscal period 2020-2021, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force was allocated some $67,946,654. The current expenditure accounted for some $57,946,654 and capital expenditure accounted for some $10 million. Mr. Speaker, according to the RBDF, for the year ending 2020, a total of some 95 vessels were at sea for a total of 3,496 patrol days collectively. These men and women are working, Mr. Speaker. That deserves a round of applause. Mr. Speaker, for the same period, there were 10 migrant interdictions, of which five were solo interdictions. The efforts resulted in 155 migrants being detained, of which Haitians accounted for 132 persons or 85 percent. Cubans accounted for some 12 persons or 7 percent. Dominicans accounted for some 8 persons or 5 percent, and others accounted for some three persons or one percent. Mr. Speaker, the numbers, these numbers highlight the fact that despite the COVID-19 pandemic, foreign nationals were still determined to enter the Bahamas illegally. Of greater significance is the fact that despite its expanding role in maintaining safety and security, the defense force is ably ready to execute its mandate to protect the sovereignty of our nation. It also means that we must continue to make the necessary investments to ensure that the agency remains equipped to respond when necessary. Mr. Speaker, in more recent times, the transnational nature of crime means that illegal activity often involves drugs, weapons, and other forms of smuggling. Narcotics interdiction reflected 5% at sea, which resulted in the seizure of some four pounds of marijuana and almost one pound of cocaine. Mr. Speaker, subsequent to the drug interdiction were four rounds of ammunition seized at sea. In addition to illegal migrants, drugs and weapons, the Defense Force seized some two Dominican fishing vessels for poaching in Bahamian waters, uh, which this reflects a sharp reduction in poaching activity. The seizures were still significant. What is, what is Collectively, Mr. Speaker, 12,163 pounds of seafood, inclusive of crawfish, scale fish, and group of confiscated 
with net fines totaling some $1,700,000. And what is, what is significant here, Mr. Speaker, is that the partnership that the Defense Force continued to forge with the fishing industry of the Bahamas, and that will continue to expand as we continue to, to introduce technology that will increase the domain and situational awareness of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force cabinet would have recently approved the acquisition of technology that will allow the RBDF to have greater awareness and see, have a greater space observation of what is taking place throughout this country. The agency individual success are attributed to improved strategies, policies, utilizing uh, analyses of tracking routes, increased patrols, and commonly used uh, migratory routes, intelligence gathering, and the use of data collected from the installation of long-range radars in strategic lo uh, locations. Concurrently, Mr. Speaker, the Defense Force is also a key ally in joint operations, both nationally and regionally, throughout joint information sharing intel with the police force and other strategic partners um, in countries in our region and throughout the world. Mr. Speaker, the decentralization of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force operation continues to be a major priority for our administration, particularly the establishment of bases in the Southern Bahamas. The decentralization allows for better maritime domain awareness a vessel will be readily available to patrol and render assistance. The bases at HMBS Matu Town and Gunpoint Ragged Island are critical, Exuma, as you would agree to the success of the Royal Bahamas Defense Force's strategic decentralization operational plan. Hence, during the first half of this fiscal period, capital works totaling in excess of $355,000 was spent at two sites in Matthew Town in Agua. Of the total amount, $127,787 was spent on major renovations, including uh, work in these areas. The remaining $227,213 was spent on electrical improvement at the Maritime Center located at the harbor in Matthew Town in Agua, included in the upgrades and installations was the power supply to the main base installation of electrical supply respect, respectfully. The electrical installation at the Maritime Center was long overdue and will now provide the necessary shore power supply for the Royal Bahamas Defense Force vessels berth alongside the dock. More importantly, this will eliminate the vessels having to continuously operate their generator. And Mr. Speaker, I would have noted in this place before that for more than four years, the Royal Bahamas Defense Force was spending on average $11,000 a month on fuel to provide power to those vessels that were docked at the base. Imagine the wear and tear on those vessels. And so, I do my I was going to come back to you. So when we talk about vessels down, it's not 13 vessels, Exuma, as I would have noted to you. We said that there were there were nine vessels, 11 vessels, and two were down under uh, awaiting repair. But here is the problem that we would have invested hundreds of millions of dollars to retrofit vessels did not provide any shore power. So can you imagine the wear and tear on those vessels? And when those vessels have to, which many of them have to do, travel down south, when they are so low on fuel, they have to return to be refueled at the base. And so we are now addressing those matters because we have to protect those vessels. And to further complicate matters or compound matters. When we took office, you know, Zuma, you touched on this. 
defense force was depleted of engineers. So we invested hundreds of millions of dollars to retrofit vessels, but we had no engineers to address any form of even basic repair. So we are addressing that now. We are, we are about to very shortly, cabinet would have approved a partnership agreement that will allow for us to clean up offices in the Royal De Bahamas Defense Force to become engineers to take care of the investment, the Bahamian people's investment. Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, additionally, some $746,519 was approved for fuel facilities at HMBS, Matthewtown, and Gunpoint Ragged Island, Exuma. So we, we, we're focusing on Ragged Island too. And the expansion of fuel storage capacity at HMBS Coral Harbor. Mr. Speaker, $246,432 was spent for the installation of a 10 thousand gallon diesel storage and auxiliary equipment on Rigel Island. So this is what I mean. We want now to, when you're down south, we put an permanent basis there, you're staying down there. We didn't want you to come up here and someone send a message or they're going to knock off a fuel. You're staying down there. All right, so we're giving you your fuel down there. We're giving you your permanent basis down there. You're setting up home down there. So you don't have to come up here and people telegraph, they're going to now so they refuel. No, no, they ain't leaving. All right, they ain't leaving. $161,442 was spent for a 20,000 gallon diesel fuel storage auxiliary at HMBS Coral Harbor. Um, Mr. Speaker, the installation of these works have been prioritized and begin Ragged Island followed by the works in Matthew Town, Inago, and the Coral Harbor Base. Mr. Speaker, temporary accommodation and other facilities were erected at gunpoint, Ragged Island, utilizing portions of the modular unit that was purchased by this government at a cost of, I think it was $1 million, uh, so that we can have that present on Ragged Island. These are modular units. They're all over the island. They, they, are, they are mobile homes that can assist us during times of crisis um, during, uh, and especially in an archipelago that we can move from point to point. And these year, the accommodation to house a 32 person, a gallery unit, two bathroom blocks, cold storage, a laundry and sick bay unit. The diesel storage has the capacity to hold 10 gallons 10,000 gallons of fuel and 9,500 gallons of fresh water. The facility will be powered by a 60 watt kilowatt diesel generator. And this is the accommodation in Gunpoint, Ragged Island. Mr. Speaker. You heard me, yeah, yeah, yeah. You heard me, temporary accommodation and other facilities were erected, were erected, okay? The completion of, the, of this work will ensure the necessary connections are made with BPL um, sources and the contractor, famous electrical, to provide adequate shore power supply. The electrification of the HMBS Coral Harbor will provide shore power, as I would have noted for patrol crafts which birth at Coral Harbor Base, and that is progressing. However, due to the pandemic, the contractor experienced some delays, but the work will be completed before the end of this current budget cycle. So even COVID, we're, we're driving this through. Mr. Speaker, the dry docking and repairs of HM Lawrence Major is expected to commence during this uh, second half of the fiscal period at a cost of $1 million. And this includes the replacement of boat generators, which have been operating constantly since the vessel has been in operation due to the lack of shore power. This is what I'm talking about. So because we did not have shore power at the base, it is now costing us 
$1 million to repair Lawrence Mason. This is what I talk about when we say planning. It's very important. You can't invest hundreds of millions of dollars in assets and don't know how you can take care of them once they get here. Because this will be the end result. And this will be the impact on the taxpayer. Because they got to pay that. But we said that uh, that should be rectified. Cleanliness is working away and we should have shore power by the end of the fiscal period. These works are expected to be completed before the start of the 2021 hurricane season because Lawrence Maze is very important to us. I wish we had two vessels like that. Given our composition, an archipelago, it is the heavy lifter. It gets heavy duty equipment, major supplies to these islands. We need another Lawrence Mason. It should, it should also be noted. Yeah, well, yeah, it's a good investment. Yeah, you should have gotten two though. But, but you can't buy it, you can't acquire it. You can't acquire it, then don't have no means. No, 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 hold it, hold it. You can't acquire, no, that's it. You can't acquire something. Uh, no, 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 you, no, no, no. Hold my time, hold my time. You can't acquire something. Then do not know you can take care of it. Now it costs us a million dollars to fix it because you did not provide any shore power. So we don't know the impact on the other vessels, but there, there is an impact that, that, we're, that we're assessing. It should also be noted that the HMBS of P48 is also nearing the completion of his of his refitting at a cost of three hundred and one thousand. The vessel is one of the forty-eight foot Dauntless patrol vessels, which is part of the fleet. Running a navy is very expensive, and so it requires proper and strategic planning to mitigate unnecessary spending. Mr. Speaker. This drone program has been, you know, a topic for some time now since the government announced the acquisition. The Defense Force is the lead agency for this, for this program. The drones will operate as a multi-agency concept, meaning that it's, it's not only the Defense Force, it's the police, corrections, it's customs, it's immigration, uh, it's physical plan, uh, who, wherever, Ministry of War, uh, land and surveys, whomever. Okay? And so to date, we would have invested some $10.9 million in the program for the acquisition of some 57 drones with varying sizes, range, and capabilities. Let me say this, Mr. Mm -hmm. Speaker. When this went out to bid, this was one of the lowest bids. We had some bids over $100 million, and in the hundreds of millions, if my memory serves me correctly, right? But, but at the end of the day, through the proper process, it was decided that this was the right route to take. And we still believe that today. The acquisition of these drones demonstrate our commitment in keeping pace with the technological advances, the integrated systems that will allow support and intelligence uh, surveillance and traffic. Let me say this, Mr. Speaker, that we have taken a multi-agency approach to this. What you will see when we roll on this program, because this program not only calls for the acquisition of drones, but also calls for a drone academy. So we will be, become a center of excellence for this region. For the region. For the region. We will be able to train law enforcement to this region around the world if it, if, if it comes to that. We have begun training already. So we have submersible that can go as, as deep as in excess of, I think it can go as far as some 700 feet below the, below the, the ocean, right? Between four and 700 feet, right? So that will help us in our maritime domain. We have drones that can do daily, hourly surveillance over the island and search for armed robbers, car thieves, whatever the case may be. 
We have drones that will be able to do coastal patrol. And we have drones that will be able to take off from the large defense force vessels and stay airborne for as much as 10 hours. Okay? So this is no ordinary, and we have drones, as I said, they're smart enough to respond to incidents as they occur. You don't have, you know, they will sense it and go to where, it, where they need to go. So this is the kind of technology that we're talking about. Okay, so we, we talked about, we talked about that, uh, Mr. Speaker. So we, we're, we're, we're proud about what the work that's being done and, and the Defense Force and, and we're grateful to our Marines and officers and the Commodore and his team for the work that we're doing. We ask our blessings on them and their families as they continue to guard our sovereignty and protect us all. Mr. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to the Department of, of Correction. Um, Mr. Speaker, and as I look at the, uh, their budget um, uh, for the fiscal period, the Department of Corrections was allotted some 32,600,000. Of that total, some 27 million eight hundred and ninety nine thousand two hundred and forty one dollars of capital expenditure um, um, and capital expenditure in the amount of some four million seven hundred and one thousand one hundred and forty two. Mr. Speaker, according to figures released by the BDOT for the year ending 2020, the recidivism rate stood at 12% compared to 2019, where it stood at 14%. According to the National Reentry and Justice Center 2014, tailored rehabilitation programs and new approaches uh, for inmate supervision can alter some uh, criminal behavior and help persons live crime-free life upon release. Mr. Speaker, during the last four years of our administration, recidivism has been on a downward trend. Not only does this mean that we are on the right track, but it also means that our four-pronged approach of new leadership investment in technology, training for inmates and officers, and good governance are indeed working. Mr. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, the success also comes against the backdrop of the COVID-19 environment. Um, no, I'd just like to note too, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I can come down. At this time, I would like to commend Commissioner Murphy for his proactive step fostering a safe and healthy institution. In the first half of this fiscal period, BDOC spent 22 million, 20, um, 22,000, I'm sorry, $853 on ensuring that the living and working environment for both officers and inmates remain sanitized. Mr. Speaker, according to who, persons in correctional institutions were more vulnerable to COVID-19 as opposed to the general pop public. A COVID-19 committee formed after the introduction of the virus continues to conduct regular risk assessment as it relates to the pandemic. There is also continuous collaboration with health, police, and the judiciary. Mr. Colbert, Mr. Mr. Speaker, the conti there continues to be a daily distribution of sanitization and disinfectant items to staff and inmates in all areas of the department. Since March of 2020, the department has had only one confirmed, one confirmed case of COVID-19 infection in the institution of an inmate. I think that's worth noting again. I would have just noted what who said. When you look at correctional institutions throughout the world, they have been beset and ravaged by the pandemic. In the Bahamas, we would have had one confirmed case at BDOC. There was another inmate 
who would have contracted the disease while in hospital. Uh, he did not return until he would have recovered. But one confirmed case. And so that, that deserves a rousing round of applause. Mr. Speaker, um, according to legislative analyst office, in order for rehabilitation or in order for inmate rehabilitation programs to be successful, there should be three key principle applied. First, the program should be evidence-based models that have actually worked. Second, the program should be assessed for cost effectiveness. And third, it should focus on high-risk inmates as this is more likely to reduce recidivism. Mr. Speaker, just allow me to say this, and I am proud to note that in partnership with CSJP, almost 500 inmates have been trained at the Bahamas Department of Correction to continue to adapt to this COVID environment. 28, 28 inmates have commenced virtual training with BTVI as part of a CSJP program. By the end of the program, it is expected that 600 inmates would be trained in various technical disciplines, while we acknowledge that the year ended in 2020 had the lowest number of participants, and we know why what this is due to. But I think what is important to note, Mr. Speaker, here is this. What is important to note is that we continue to invest in officers of DDoS and inmates. And these trainings are not designed just for the inmates at Bahamas Department of Correction. They are getting genuine, genuine BTDI certificates. The same certificates that they're getting on the outside. And so these persons, after leaving the prison, can begin their careers anew with certificates, and they can go and further their education and their training. Mr. Speaker, let, let me just say this. You know, and what what is important what is important what is important to note. And we talk about we talk about the, the, the training that they're undergoing. We are we are truly getting into this what rehabilitation means in its truest sense. Yeah. And we are a government who believe in giving a second chance. Just at the end of last year we would have we would have considered more than two hundred applications for clemency within the Bahamas Department of Corrections. And as a result, we would have approved the Prerogative Board of Mercy, approved the release of more than 143 inmates after that exercise. That alone, Mr. Speaker, is more than any government would have done in his previous time. That's one exercise alone. Well, no government okay, all the governments combined. So this is demonstration, clear evidence of the fact that we truly believe in giving officers a second chance. In addition, Mr. Speaker, inmates a second chance. In addition, Mr. Speaker, you would have heard the chairman of the Rehabilitation of Offenders Committee, former Commissioner Paul Parker who is truly committed to this process of expungement. And this government continues to expunge the record of Bahamians who are demonstrating that they would have properly in in reintegrated into society. And so we encourage Mr. Speaker, especially our young men and women out there with police records, that to come and apply we beg you, we implore you, come and apply so that you can be considered, right, for a clean police record. We're committed to that, right? And so we ask that you do so. Mr. Speaker, with the remaining of my time, I want to address the Parliamentary Registration Department. I now shift my attention there. And globally, COVID-19 has severely disrupted societies and economies and lives. 
The virus has also created an unprecedented situation for administration for the administration of, of elections. According to the Commonwealth election 2020, while many elections have been postponed, the practice of elections are expected to be impacted for years to come as a result of COVID-19. In light of the current health crisis, our administration continues to work assiduously to deliver on its obligation and towards strengthening its institutions and priorities that permit services to the people that they were elected to serve. In this day, in December of 2020, we put forward amendments which were passed to establish a permanent register. With the passage of the Parliamentary Elections Amendment Act 2020, the legal requirements for the five-year register was repealed, and the new permanent register came into force. The core of the permanent register, the register comes from the 2017 register, and it is expected to evolve over the future election cycle. With the continuous additions of new voters, transfers, the removal of deceased voters, and voters who cease to be qualified to remain on the register. As of March 1st, or March 2nd, 2021, after purging, there are 187,640 registered persons, which reflects an increase of some 6,097, or 3% increase of registrants from the 2017 register. So, so, so let, me, let me go back. So that, that, that 6,097 doesn't reflect all new voters. The register would obviously would have been adjusted over a period uh, and persons who would have died due to the purging, persons who were taken off uh, for, for reasons according to law, right? So it is more in the area of 12 plus thousand new voters since, since 2017 to the present, okay? Okay, so what does that mean? We say that under this new legislation, we're seeking, we should be registering somewhere between 20 and 25,000 new voters. And, and we're, we're saying that today, between 2017 and now, we're somewhere in excess of 12,000. And so we are therefore well on our way of completing our process in a timely manner. In manner. In other, in other words, uh, uh, Mr. Speaker, persons who registered for the 2017 general election and who have not reallocated to a different residence for a period of 90 days or more shall remain registered as a voter entitled to vote at an election on the permanent register unless his or her name has been removed from the register by the parliamentary commissioner. In other words, Mr. Speaker, Bahamians who were registered to vote in 2017 election and who have not moved to another constituency or polling division do not have to register again for the 2022 general election. Only qualified Bahamians who are not on the 2017 voters register or who have moved to an address different from the one on their current voters card, need to visit the parliamentary center to register or some other center designated by the parliamentary commissioner or transfer their registration to a new polling division and constituency where they now reside. Mr. Speaker, registration has been ongoing when permitted at the following sites since the last election with health and safety protocols being strictly adhered to. The registration center now includes the parliamentary registration department head office, the parliamentary registration department sub office in Freeport, and the Family Islands administrator's offices. 
All of the above is occurring during regular hours from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. So registration has been continued. Mr. Speaker, phase two, however, on Monday, February 15, 2021, phase two of the voters registration exercise began with health and safety protocols being strictly adhered to. The following centers have been operational to complement the main voters registration site. On New Providence, six additional centers were open, including Town Center Mall Post Office, Brunstown Community Center, Parker Street, South Beach Post Office, Elizabeth Estates Post Office, Carmichael Road Post Office, Cable Beach Post Office. On Grand Bahama, five additional centers were open, including St. Mary Magdalene Anglican Church Hall, St. Stephen's Anglican Church Hall, the Masonic Lord's Hall, Church of the Apostolic Church, Church of Christ Apostolic Church, and the Administrative Office in Jonestown. Family Island's Administrative Offices will continue registration as usual, Mr. Speaker, from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. Monday through Friday. Mr. Speaker, later this month, phase three of the voters registration exercise will begin with health and safety protocols being strictly adhered to. The following pop-up centers will be operational to complement the main and sub-voters registration exercise site. On New Providence, three pop-up sites will be open, including Yamba Village, Adelaide, Fox Hill Community Center, and various work workplaces taking into consideration safety protocols. Evening and Saturday registration in strategic locations such as schools will be open. So we intend to make registration accessible to the people. And so the parliamentary commissioner is organizing and ensuring that he and his team go into communities throughout New Providence to become more accessible to those, the elderly, those persons who can't get around. And from time to time, you have a group of persons, a lot that you need to be registered. You can reach out to the parliamentary registration office and speak to the parliamentary commissioner, and he would make it happen. We want to be accessible, and we're demonstrating that. Pop-up sites will be open, including New Canaan, uh, New Canaan Zion Baptist Church, Blue Road, Church of God, Hawksville, Grand uh, Bahamian Way, St. Nicholas Einerkin Church Hall, East End, and evenings and Saturday registrations in strategic locations such as schools will be open. Mr. Speaker, the aforementioned registration centers are designed to facilitate access to registration for a targeted group. The targeted groups are inclusive of new registrants. This refers to eligible persons who are 18 years of age and above and not on the current register. Transfers, the re this refers to persons already registered on the voters list, but who have moved from one place of occupancy to another for a period of 90 days or more. Legal name changes, Mr. Speaker, to ensure the accuracy of the permanent register. The parliamentary commissioner will, one, engage in continuous editing of the permanent register, the registration list. Two, the permanent register will be continuously purged of deceased persons. Three, new registrants will be added. Four, transfers will be processed daily. Five, incarcerated persons' voting rights will be suspended and six scrutinaires to test the validity of the register will be deployed to all registration centers. And this is, what, this is what's important. Mr. Speaker, there will be no hanky pint hearing as long as I have oversight of the parliamentary registration department. We will ensure, and the parliamentary commissioner is making this an emphasis, that only those persons who are legally entitled and eligible to, to, to vote in a particular area will be voted. 
So if you have the strategy of sneaking in and moving into addresses, that, that, that ain't gonna happen this time around. It ain't gonna happen. Scrutinaires will be, and if I have to go to cabinet to get more scrutinaires, that's what we're gonna do. Okay? The Bahamian people deserve it. Mr. Speaker, to ensure that the public has every opportunity to access registration sites and have their questions and concerns addressed. The Parliamentary Registration Department will provide information via media platform, including the respective leading newspapers in the nation, radio and television public service announcements, press conferences, billboards, and we have the electric, electronic billboards throughout the island, uh, that we have already begun using. The website at www.elections.gov.bf. And they can also be ac accessed through their social media accounts, inclusive of Facebook, Parliamentary Registration Department, Twitter. We, we, Mr. Speaker, we, we're in the modern ages here. Twitter, WhatsApp. You too, and I know some people, who are coming to that? We are a government that delivers on promises, by the way. Mr. Speaker, our administration's modernization, you must, you must have a copy of this speech, by the way. Our administration modernization, uh, our administration's modernization, run out of time here, of the electronic process. We have made provisions for the introduction. We have made provisions, Mr. Speaker, for the introduction of biometric permanent voters' cards. We have made provisions for the introductions of biometric permanent voters' cards. Section 14, subsection 3 makes provisions for the parliamentary commissioner to replace paper voters' cards and counterfeit. This technology will be phased in as part of the transformation process at the parliamentary registration department. Biometric technology, Mr. Speaker, will be introduced, thereby allowing the department to capture unique Physical characteristics, so no hanky panky on them little papers, dip finger, all that. We informed with that. We get in there. We get in there. All right. The data will be used to verify and identify individuals registering to vote. Mr. Speaker, with this technology, the Parliamentary Registration Department will not have to ask a person to confirm their identity. Love that fine word. This is because. In a biometric identification system, the individual does not need to claim an identity. His or her biometric features will be captured and then compared to the features of all previously captured biometric data stored. This technology will serve to improve the integrity of our voters' registration process as it will reduce identity theft and hanky panky in. Ah, I love that. That's my buzz. That's my buzz word for the day. Also, it will eliminate. Also, it will eliminate. I will make sure you get them ten thousand people you talk about. I'm trying to help you here. Who following you? Oh, only three thousand. We take away seven. We take away seven. It will eliminate the possibility of voter fraud as it will be used at polling stations to confirm the identity and eligibility of voters. Mr. Speaker, the third oldest democracy the Bahamas is in the Western Hemisphere, undergirding this democracy, is the will of the people who are reasonable for electing their leaders. I encourage all Bahamians to continue to participate in this, in this valued process by registering to vote. I encourage you to register and vote. The day will come for you to vote your choice. Right, Pine Ridge? Despite the challenges of the COVID-19 pandemic, Mr. Speaker, the Parliamentary Registration Department remains committed to achieving its objectives in light of the aforementioned. 
I would like to thank the acting parliamentary commissioner and the outgoing parliamentary commissioner, Mr. Turner, and Mr. Turner, for the work that he would have done during the time that he was there. And now Mr. Duncan's still in office. His advisory team, a very um, skilled individual, right? I'd like to thank them for going over and beyond the call. Your work, service, and dedication have not gone unnoticed. Mr. Speaker, we do so much work, and this government does so much work. I said I wanted a short speech. I cut out 100 pages. I still got 100 left. So, but, but I, will, I will end there in the interest of time, Mr. Speaker. Only to, only to say this. I got how much more? Three minutes. How much? How much? I got. Three minutes. We got someone here who like to ring the bell. Yeah, we got we got a, we got a, someone who like to ring the bell here. We got a good bell ringer. Huh? How much more minutes? Oh, uh, twenty more minutes. Uh, Twelve minutes. Yes, sir. I can give. I I want to be able to, Mr. Speaker. I want to be able to to at least uh, show my presence at the funeral of this 18-year-old. Uh, so let allow me, Mr. Speaker, I beg your forgiveness, um, and just say this, that as the minister responsible for national security, I would like to, and on, on behalf of our government, I would like to say a special Thank you to all of those persons who fall under the remit of the Ministry of National Security, especially the men and women in uniform on the front line. Those in the Royal Bahamas Police Force and the Prime Minister would have said to them recently during the opening of the Real Time Crime Center that as soon as opportunity permits, Love will be coming their way. To those in the Bahamas Department of Correction, we got you. And you will be hearing from us very shortly, very shortly. We would have, we would have extended the age for those sub officers in the Bahamas Department of Correction who were retiring much too early. We would have done that. We are working now, we would have done, we are now working assidu assiduously to ensure that BDOC, like the police force, are able to have their own commission, all right, that will allow for their promotions to be processed as quickly as the police and the defense force. And so that is an impediment that we promise that we will deliver on, and we're working very hard to make it happen. Okay? The machinery is moving. All right? We continue to, to recruit to the Bahamas Department of Correction to ensure that those numbers, we may have recruitment there for a while, but we continue to recruit. We just passed out about um, close to 80 persons, especially in, in this COVID environment. 82, uh, uh, my, my brother, minister from the public service is, 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 is saying to me, right? And to our brothers and sisters in the defense force. You know, we share the same building now. Thanks for starting that, but you know, it took so long. Uh, well, I guess, sorry for that. One, but almost 10, almost, almost. Branson, so, uh, not Branson. Uh, my brother, God knows. Tell me all, eight years. We've been working on that building. Got a lot of stories to tell on that, but not yet. We ain't but anyway, we share that with the Commodore and his executive command, and it's always a good feeling in the morning, Mr. Speaker, when I pull up and walk into the and to be greeted by our DDF officers who are always sharp and on duty. You know, Prime Minister tell uh, he said to our law enforcement people, some good things are coming soon. I believe it. 
The acronym, Mr. Speaker, has always been a government for law enforcement and those people on the front line and continues to deliver on that. Okay, continues to live on that. From, from former Prime Minister Hubert Ingram. That's why they love him so much. And Hubert Menace now doing the same. So, so, so some things are coming into our reserve office. We finish an audit. You haven't had a promotion in six years. You know, people come in here and, and they're speaking on your behalf. But in six years, you haven't had a promotion. We fixing that for you. In six years. Can't be. I can fight for you, reservist. Yeah, yeah. Like I say. Some people come in here and pretend as if they are defending and talking on their behalf, but haven't done anything for the reservists for a very long time. <laughs> you are the spokesman for the reservists and haven't promoted them in six years. Is that love? Is that love, my brother? You lose her? Can't feel the love. Huh? They. Well, one, one day, one day, I'm going to send, I would like to meet Dave because the day name has been called a lot in this place. I got to go to the funeral card. Come and finish that. Uh, uh, honorable Who's member. You the, the, the chair recognizes the honorable member for Anglison on a point of order. Yes, I see the member is, um, drew me on the record on his debate. Uh, I've raised in this parliament, Mr. Speaker, I've raised in this parliament multiple times the concern of reserve officers who say they were promised they would be paid at comparable rate to, um, I don't know, rated officers or whatever, how it's called, and that they've not been paid that. I've brought it into this minister's attention over and over. If he wants the names, I will give them to him. They are senior officers. They worked in the, in the shelters. They are unanimous in what the agreement was. And they're saying that this minister and this government has not kept their promise and undertaking to those officers. Thank you, uh, Angus. <coughs> um, you know, when I, when I gave my last budget address, yes. I started off by bringing in some nice large plot cards mm -hmm. that had the commissioner's name telephone contact, mm -hmm. the deputy commissioner, the assistant commissioner, yes. the commodore, everybody. And I said to all of my colleagues, Mr. Speaker, in this honorable place, you don't need the minister to get answers. And what I intend to do, Mr. Speaker, is before, is before, is before the next election, I intend to sit on a platform in social space, virtual space and allow members of the public with the commission and all of them, all of us, to put questions to us. You see, we come in this place, Mr. Speaker, and we say, Dave. How, who Dave? How do you spell his name? D-E-Y or T-H-E-Y? How do you spell his name? I won't find him. I, I can't find Dave. Oh, but you always oh, oh, use honorable the members. Dave. Did, did you recognize the honorable member for Angleston on a point of order? The speaker, on a point of order, Speaker, um, I have all the names of the officers. I don't think it appropriate to call the names of, of individuals who do not sit in this house. I can share the names of the minister, but I, I really do not think, Mr. Speaker, that, it, that the minister is serving himself well by minimizing or making fun of the very deep concern of officers who have served this country, who went in those shelters at short notice, and you have not paid them as you promised to do so. Do the right thing. Don't drag it out. Pay the people, but don't make fun of, of their plight. That's not right. Mr. Speaker, I, I, I said in this house over and over that we presented a cabinet paper that was, present, that was sent to my ministry by the then commissioner, 
on what was outstanding as a result of, because Dorian was an unusual thing, all right? And they had expended their budget, all right? And so they, they needed additional funding. They provided for that to pay the rest of the reserve. Cabinet approved that. And that actually, the money had to be taken from another head because we wanted to ensure that we reward our reserve officers. Let me finish, please. No, 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 you, you only have, I have five. I have five. Let me, can I finish? So you talk about speaking on behalf of officers, um, 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 Angliston. You haven't promoted the reserves in more than six years. You haven't promoted them in more than six years. Member. How many point of order do you have it's, on it's the same problem? The honorable okay, member. Point of order. I think point of order. the member is saying that we, that you, me, um, have not promoted officers in six years, but this, this member being there for four years. Why are you enjoying the four years of the six years? You had four. So when you don't brag about it, take responsibility because you have not done it. A four, uh, the majority of that six years is you. It's you. Okay, no problem. So don't talk about you. You talk about yourself. You have not done it. You've not, re you've not promoted the reserve officers in, in four years of that six years. You can forgive the two, but you had four. You have done nothing for the reserve. We have a report. I shared it. I, I brought the report into this, on, uh, did an audit of the Royal Bahamas Police Force Reserve. I tabled it in this house. You have a copy. You should read it. Uh, no, I, no, I understand. I understand. You should read it. You, I understand, Mr. Speaker, come into this house as if she's speaking on the behalf of the reserve. Continue to say day. You and I speak every day. You can provide the name. You've been talking about this for months. Okay? Why are you going to just provide the names to me? Why are you going to provide the names to me now? But that, that's, that's, the, that's the trickery that they are... Uh, 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 honorable members, I'm not going to permit this yeah, to go... The trickery. Uh, honor, honorable members, I, 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 I'm not going to permit this to go uh, any further. Up. Let me wrap up. Let me wrap up. No, no, no. All right, that's your strategy. And, and I expect the speaker, the independent speaker, to protect this member. Withdraw it, Withdraw it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you, because it looked like I wasn't going to get protection just now. Uh, honorable thank member. You. Thank you. Honorable member, refrain from refre um, um, casting re reflections on the chair. Well, don't let her go, loud speaker. Uh, uh, honorable member, resume your seat. Resume your seat. I respect yeah, we were drawing this in. But it's it is a part of the old this it's an old strategy from the old political playbook. Day. So many stories is, is told about this day. One day I hope to meet Day. All right. Well I I I'll end with that, Mr. Speaker. I just would just no well the, the, the law enforcement, no, I love that. They see the genuineness and what we do. The men, the men and women of law, and I speak to reservists every day. I speak to police officers every day, okay? I live what they live, all right? I give my heart and soul to them. And we delivered on the promises that we would have made to them. And all of the promises that you left behind, we delivered on that too, okay? We we delivered on that too, but we could we could deliver we could deliver for the reserve, okay, and we can retool it as well. Okay? Honor, honorable member for Mar, um, Mon Mariah, speak to the chair. Yes, sir. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker, I conclude by saying to the men and women of law enforcement that yours is a government, a caring government, one who understands your plight and continue to work towards addressing your needs and your concern. We don't yeah. only talk. This is a government that's not only talk the talk, but we walk the walk, you know? Um, and so, you know, I have said to every member in this house that I am accessible if there are issues. Um, I am accessible because we're all about creating a better Bahamas. So I thank the men and women, the permanent secretary and her team at the Ministry of National Security, the commissioner of police and his team and the Royal Bahamas Police Force, the men and women of Royal Bahamas 
Police Force, the Bahamas Department of Correction, and the Royal Bahamas Defense Force, that we will continue to do the best for you. And we pray for you and your families that God will continue to guide and protect you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Honorable Member. The, the Chair recognizes the Honorable Member for Pine Ridge Yes. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Yeah. Now, I just wanted to ask Mount Mariah. Um, I, I, I commend the biometric. I just was trying to get a clear understanding. Will the biometric cards be ready for this upcoming general election? That's what I was trying to get from you. Thank you. Sure, recognize the Honorable Member for Mount Mariah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Pine Ridge. No, but it's on the book, and uh, work will begin in earnest. But I don't foresee that it will be ready between now uh, and the next general election. Um, and so we want to make sure that we're phasing this properly, and uh, that there are no 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 additional issues leading into the general election. Thank you. Thank you. As many. To recognize the honorable member for Yamakro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Just a moment. Just a moment. Thank you. As many. The chair recognizes the member for Yamakro. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, let me say that it's a delight to stand here today. Uh, Pardon me? You can hear me? It's a delight. Can you hear me? Okay. Mr. Speaker, let me say it's a delight uh, to stand here today to make uh, to bring or make contributions to this mid-term budget on behalf of the good my family. Mention my family who's been very supportive. Uh, my wife, the good people of Yamakro, uh, and to give an account, Mr. Speaker, for my stewardship not only as a member of parliament for Yamakro, but also as the minister with responsibility for the Ministry of Immigration, Trade and Industry, uh, Financial Services, Trade and Industry and Immigration. Uh, but Mr. Speaker would be remiss of me if I did not make mention of, of some occurrences that occurred because I came here in the house this morning and I heard a speech being delivered night. Nobody was here. Pine Ridge was here. It was just you, Pine Ridge. And I asked, you know, who is that delivering such in such an eloquent uh, manner? My car was my car was here, and I was told that it was uh, the Linden. It was the last speech of the Linden before he demitted office, and um, uh, I took the opportunity to listen and to learn. And so, Mr. Speaker, I was very happy to hear that, and I hope that going forward, we can have, you know, persons who are just coming into this house, they can hear speeches uh, of the Cecil and some of the more memorable speeches, Mr. A.D. Hanna, and those that we can replay those so that, you know, persons can listen to them. I think they provide an excellent tutorial for those persons who weren't here, and they can hear, they can hear. Not just, not just not what they've been told, but hear these persons deliver and see how they would have conducted themselves in this honorable place. The speaker uh, on earlier on this week, the member for South Andhra really touched, touched my heart when he said he was not going to be offering uh, in the next general election. And the speaker, I thought it would be remiss of me. And of anybody in this house who had the good fortune uh, or who God has been blessed 
how South Andhra touched their lives. Not make mention of uh, this giant of a man, uh, a man who is the son of the soil. And I first came to know uh, South Andhra as a boy in Kell Island, because all you, we didn't have television and we didn't have electricity, but you would have the hometown boy broadcasting. And I mean, calling the names of individuals who would probably never be heard on the radio. And then they were on an AM station. So, you know, that went far beyond the Bahamas. And persons look forward to, to the hometown boy show because he called my aunties. And he would call, they were responsible for, for managing the Bluebird Club in Dowd, Kell Island, New Bike, Kell Island. So you can imagine these ladies hearing their names call. And then I was fortunate when he came for the regatta because he was big up the regatta. And I first met him. And my chore was to clean the table. So here it is, potato bread, cassava bread, and all these different things that are bohemian are being made. And they're preparing this smorgasbord of delight for the hometown boy. And you know, and he's there with the voice, hi, good morning, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, you know, you, you are, listen, it was an honor to be left in the, that company with these grown people to clean the table. I was looking at the hometown boy and seeing my auntie them, you know, because some worked in the kitchen and then some would come out and clean. My duty was to take those things off the table. And I got an opportunity to hear him speak, to speak because all of the ZNS crew would come up with him, you know, and they would move in a group, but they traveled in a van. He's the big people on the island. <laughs> but what was, and I say that joking, uh, because what it identified for me was here is a man that respects the ethno, the history, and the culture of the island. It was unashamed to celebrate it. You see these things when you travel, and persons are telling you for their food. And so, and then I came to know him even better when I was elected as a member of the house. He was one of the persons who would come into the smoker's room and really tell you, that's how I get to, got to know about BJ. That's right. And I say that respectfully about BJ. You get to hear about Mr. Ingram. You'd hear about the mistakes that people would have made. He told you, you cannot, he told me, you cannot learn parliamentary procedure if you don't attend parliament. You have to be here on time. When, the, when there's an, the, when, when, and then it's a delight to see Anglison and the other members when issues arise about the rules. You take out your rules, you read it, you study it. That's right, you go home, that's right, you go home, you look at it, and you check it over. And then you, you, that's how you get to learn it. And like Angerson says, you do personal reflections of everything that happened on the day. So, Mr. Speaker, and then I started, I ran in Yamakraw. And everybody told me where he lived. Uh, he did not, he encouraged me, like some other politicians from both sides did. Uh, he is my constituent, and I love him. And I do recall after we created the backyard farm, the largest backyard farm, in New Providence. Uh, I would go there early in the morning before I come to go to work. Sometimes you need to distress from everything you hear during the day. And he would say, my wife saw you before Mr. Johnson was across in the farm today, but I really went there just to distress. Sometimes I go up on the weekend and he would come out and he would engage me. But a part of that engagement was really to assist me to make the adjustment. But sometimes you're thinking about your bill, bills, you think, and this is the real part of politics. You're thinking about your family, you're thinking about the requisitions that people are making of you. Uh, you're thinking about how you organize the ministry, organize as an MP, and he would just talk to me. And when I would, when I would have left, I was empowered to go again. And so Mr. Speaker, I said, it was very sad. And you know, I do recall when this matter first came, I, I stood on this very same floor and I said to the member of Cat Island, who is not here today, strangely enough, said, listen, this is a committed and loyal gentleman. Whenever their attack was on on Cat Island, he would jump to his feet. He would put himself, and, and Pine Ridge is a green, put himself in the way and block the fiery spears or darts who were heading toward Cat Island. So I said to him right there, I said, this is an honorable man. This is a faithful man. You have, you can't be going back and forth. What, what, what is the deal with him? And it wasn't my business, you know, because that's my cousin and I love him too. But what is the deal? Be fair with him. 
And he said to me in the presence of, of yeah, everything is okay. But to be going into the community and hearing this, and I go, I know, I know, I, I just, I'm young again, this. To go and being back and forth on the treat the member for South Andres the way that he was treated. It's unacceptable. You just don't do these things. Let me tell you what I said about my party to my party. And the member for Kalani is not here. We were having a discussion. <clears throat> I said, let me say this. I did not come to this party to be made out with Johnson. I know who I am. Let me tell you what created me. Going to Kerala Island as a boy, my aunt and my grandmother waking me up early in the morning to pray, teaching me how to work and telling me you could be suffering during the South. So you don't need to depend on anybody, but treat them with respect. That's who I am. I, you didn't make it. So I, I, said, I, I said to my party now, if you're not going to run me, tell me you're going to run me. I mean, that, we, could, we, can, we can have a discussion with, with, the, with the executives yes. of Yamakura. Yes. And I could perhaps even walk with the fellow you sending in. But don't let me go on the road for six, seven months. Expend funds that I don't have when I could be concentrating on rebuilding my firm, right? Tell me that now. And then what I can do, pardon me? Pardon me? Make you cry? <laughs> I get into you. <laughs> so, <coughs> just tell me, and let me go. Put the man going, this one, and listen, this is my research. This one saying you back, someone else in here. Someone else in there. Now he's in South Andra. The horse is already... Funny? I agree with you. Just tell me. Just uh, find it. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yes. And so now he's in South Andhra. Now he, he's in South Andhra. When he's done, allow it. Let me tell you some leadership. Leadership calls for strength, Mr. Deputy Speaker. When you speak, and so you know what the prime minister said to me after I told him that I ain't got to, I ain't got to beat around the bush, you know, because being an MP don't make out quick. I called my auntie this morning. She was, but she said I'm in prayer meeting. Da. So I said, just let me know. I, I could go, and I could do some other things. You should have told the man now to come out and say all this nonsense. And then I listened this morning. I listened this morning. And I see on the front page, and I was so happy to hear Sir Lyndon. Uh, listen, say what you like. Do what you like. My father was a knight of the long knife. Sir Lyndon still got all of us going his way. <laughs> huh? Come on, you all know that. He still got all of us going his way. I don't care what they say on that side. On That's right. He got us going his way. He used to love that song. I'm not going to get in that, but straighten it out. It's very disheartening when I see this young lady, when I hear the back and forth. Straighten it out. There's one other thing I want to say. And then, you know, somebody said to me, somebody said to me, you know, you got the Linden daughter in one way, and then you're trying to hold back Adriana's daughter. How you can do that? How you can do that? And, and let me tell you that I've made it. I've made it clear, you know. I've, I've, I've made it clear. See, I remember an old gentleman told me that she's say, with some people, with some people, uh, I made no, you know, a, 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 a Anglican's brother took me in as a son when I had nowhere to go. I found my father years after uh, when I became a minister. I was still a constable of the police, of a police, and he was writing letters all the time. I see all the letters that's on my file. They hide it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm your lawyer. I'm your lawyer. And so when it comes to Anglican, if the angel Grable jump out, we can wrestle him, right? And so, no, that is dead wrong. The other thing I want to say, this is what I want to say, and this is why I call on Cat Island, and, and I wish he was here so I could see him face to face. Yeah, as family, to say this to him. There's a gentleman that I don't, Mr. Spe Mr. Deputy Speaker, I don't hold no card or represent him, like I'm Anglican's lawyer. I don't hold no card for him. But you see, there's a former gentleman that held a distinguished office that I heard uh, 
allegations being made go. Now you may you may question his dancing style. That's the right honorable uh, Perry Christie. You may question his dancing style, the shuffle. But I've heard certain things said about him. Uh, and I don't know that to be the man. Now, I, I know that there are some allegations being made about Nygaard Key, and I've called upon him to, you know, say things, or say something about the women. But when I heard the thing about Mr. Christie and about him exposing himself, you know, I find it very difficult to believe it, and I would give him the benefit of the doubt. That is much, and this is big man talking here now. Give him the benefit of the doubt. But I would have expected that Carol would get up and say, hey, at least it deserves an investigation to protect the office of this gentleman and say what you like about him. He gave it his best shot. It's difficult being in politics. You know, I have respect for those who run and don't succeed. But for my good friend and brother, the hometown boy, yes, for my good friend, and that's right, my good friend and brother, the hometown boy, who stood strong, stood tall. And you know, I fell in love with him, and I, I can get to my speech. I can power for his lot. <laughs> I remember when he spoke about the Church of God. I know when you read Michael Creighton and you listen to the history of the Bahamas about churches and the accepted churches. In some of the mainstream churches, black people weren't accepted there. They built this different one for you. So when the Church of God came on the scene, they were seen as crazy drunk people. Huh? But you know what they have done for this Bahamas? How they have assisted to lay the foundation around the hair and get up. And they talk about the Church of God. Prophecy. You know, a lady was going away. Going away. Going away to the jumpers. Was going away. And they were saying that when persons go abroad, and they come back in the foreign service. Sometimes they cannot make the adjustment with going home. So I had to say to the young lady, I don't want you to be like that. Because it's like mama fry fish, bake potato bread, and do everything to send you away. You go to university. And that's just truncated education. That ain't really education. Because I see some people with doctor's degree, doctor's degree, you almost get knocked down going across the road. <laughs> you come back and then you talk with mama don't speak good. Uh, who are you? So when I heard him talk about the Church of God, and I saw the Church of God just produce a big volume, I said, I love this man. I could talk about Dowds even more. And then when I heard him talk about his mother, I said, my God. See, when you hear about David and his mother approached him, people didn't trust going around David. But when his mother came, he listened to his mother. And the Bible calls upon us to respect him. And he talked about how his mother worked at Kentucky Fried Chicken and how she sacrificed for him, his siblings. He said, I respect this man. I respect this man. This is mom. And even more so, even more so, I fell in love with him. As I told my party, I didn't come here for you to make me Ellsworth Johnson. And let me add this, steak and lobster, I really don't like them things. Give me some hominy <laughs> and gruel. So when he made the decision, he said, man, you can't treat me this way. We don't hardly see that in politics. You can't treat me this way. Be honest, be upright. Hold and tangle where we weave. That's why I said about Keran, I wish he was here. He rides two horses, a high horse. And I told him, be careful, because he could fall off that and break his neck. And then, be careful of the low horse, because sometimes he really drops low. And I would be able to respond to him when he comes back. He didn't allow Angleston to speak, and now he's in South Andrew. Now he's in South Andrew. Just, you know, just get him. Say, listen, my house, well, you know, my wife watches. But in my house, <laughs> <laughs> there's some things I say in the go. You understand what I'm saying? The Linden and the political party, you know that. It's my man. I need you all to support him. Papa, Papa, you're home. This is your boy Ellsworth. I'm so happy that, and I pray for you, that you're home now, you're convalescing, and I expect to hear you in your normal way that you, you know, have assisted us. Well, when you hear Papa say, that's right. 
Say what you want. I hear Mark talking about the boss, right? Mark still wants a meeting with, with Dr. Minnis. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, he was my friend. <laughs> but let me tell you about him. Let me refer, tell you. refer to the member. Refer to the member. Let me tell you about Dr. Minnis. Let me, let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you about Dr. Minnis. <laughs> There's certain things, it is what it is. But he was, let me tell you, it's, it's dead, it's dead. All the members, dead, members, members. It's dead members. wrong to treat a gentleman, an anthropologist, a friend, a father. And when I talk about friend, you, you know, when you got in, in Parliament, you have posed this one on that side and this one on that side, but this gentleman will come to you and tell you, just don't be too jocular. You know, uh, carry yourself this way, dress this way. He tells you about everything. You treat him that way. Not only that, you know, when the chosen one, when the chosen one, right, would duck and sit low, and you better sit low. Because, boy, he in a kiddling mode now. Sit low. But when the chosen one would be quiet, when the chosen one would be quiet, it was South Andrew. Sometimes he would get up to defend him, and he really didn't have much to say, you know. He can say, hey, 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 wait a second. He can't say that, Mr. Speaker. He can't do this. He can't do that. And, and just throw somebody right off their game. Right off their game. And it would give Cat Island a, an opportunity to catch his breath. And so I just would like to warn all on sundry. And all on sundry that South Andrew deserves better. The legacy, the legacy, and I'm not getting it, the legacy, the legacy of Sir Linden deserves better. And like I said, say what you like. And listen, you got plenty friends. Do, you, do what you like. Sir Linden got all of us going his way. And the right honorable Gladstone Perry Christie at least deserves someone to stand and say, Listen, I give him the benefit of the doubt. Innocent until proven guilty. Let's say something to protect these women and children, but have an investigation. And again, as I say, I salute you, uh, South Andrews. I love you. I love the respect that you've shown for family, for culture, for religion, and for the, this honorable house, and for your colleagues. And I wish you all the best. And, you know, faith, I remember I was at a certain place. I was at the law school when I was leaving. I said, all of us need our feral experience. Because when you get your feral experience, it's, it's got, when you think about the children, he was sending you somewhere where you need to be. And so you take it for what it is. But I think there are higher heights for you. I know there are higher heights for you. My family and I are praying for you. And my family, the ladies in Dowdskill Island, that you could come there for a weekend to rest and they can prepare all the food that you like. The only thing I can warn you about, I got Annie name and Jenny. She'll take you on the campaign trail. And you know, my co cousin is in there. So I would start by saying this, <laughs> that for the first time, Cat Island has somebody who has endeavored to articulate a strategic plan for the social, economic, and historical development of Cat Island. Cat Island, the now member of Cat Island has been there for almost more than 15 years and still telling the people, carry, sweat, carry water in buckets. And calling the gentleman, Long Island, a child for his attempt to do so. People are outside at the airport in a small little airport with where the rain wet them and the sun dry them and he don't care. There are still potholes in the road where people go with um, uh, the, the coal patch to try and patch the road. The docks are uneven. The schools are empty. As much as he says that he loves rake and scrape, you don't hear him come in here and announce it. You don't hear him, hear him talk about it with love and respect. Don't worry about my time. I'm trying to say to you, I'm listen, Exuma, you got to stand. Exuma, look at me, please. <laughs> you you, you got to stand strong. 
Hey, I'm across. Speak to the chair. Speak to the chair. If you want to lead this country, you have to be the, able to articulate a strategic plan for its development. I commend you. You always on the ground round with the Lutra Airport and all that. Not Cat Island. But for the first time, you have somebody who's prepared to articulate a strategic plan for the social, economic, and historical development of an island. An island that is supposed to be on par with Exuma or Abaco. Or further, when you look at its history, at the turn of the century, Cat Island was there. I mean, not even a, not even a proper road to the hermitage. And this is the gentleman who says he wants to run this country. Yeah. I, you know, I get up in here and I spoke one day and he decided, and I, uh, he could answer, he whispered something and senior members of the Progressive Liberal Party call me and say, son, don't worry about that. I say, worry. My grandma said, if they don't say something worse than me that they said about the master, I got nothing to worry about. But you see, he bought it with my friend, an innocent person, who all he did was support him and fought and fight for him. That's all he did. And show strength for him. And every now and then, he tried to match up my auntie, Glenn, uh, Anglister. <laughs> Nominate her. <laughs> I mean, this man has said absolutely if, 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 you know, you know, they would say, if you want to see, if you want to see how someone, what someone thinks about them, themselves, Go to their home. I don't have no grass in my home, right? But I got a bush that I sweep it up with. So you can find no grass in the front. I like trees. I plant coconut trees and all those different things. My house is clean. I have a plan for it. I have a plan for my children. For this place that he claims that he loves, Cat Island. Nothing! You fly in two days before the election with the platinum and smile. Huh? Where, where are the docks? No more. I mean, before the election, three clinics. Well, you can build three big clinics on Cat Island Four. You spend more than a million dollars, and you break down the mall. And people had to put the people on ice. And and this and this is and this is the man who says he wants to run the country. Ask him first. Does he have a strategic development plan for Cat Island? None. When asked, when asked. Why should you be made prime minister? You say, me? Yeah. It's not about you. That's why sometimes I just say to him, you know, you know what you bring, he says, me. That's why I say to, to my good cousin, you know, you're so vain. You think every song is about you. There has to be a plan. You know, it has to be much more substance, much more substance. But let me tell you something. To mother an innocent man like this, when all you had to do is stand up and say, this my man. This my man. Everybody has back off. And then to get on the, the television knows. station and say, and don't let him speak for you, Exuma. He was so enamored by what was happening. He couldn't bang on the desk. He just, you know. Oh, he was in shock. Oh my God. All he had to do was make one trip to San Andreas with my and hasn't been there unless, and that's what, that's what the people tell me. They was calling him to come to South Andrew, saying, settle this out. Settle it. He shouldn't be going from house to house and finding out the different people calling. It ain't right to him, and it ain't right to other people. It ain't right to him, and it ain't right to other people. And, and, and South Andrew deserves an apology. And I pray that he finds it in his heart to forgive him. And, and all leaders have to be there. If you don't want people, you know you don't want him. Let him know. Let him know. So I will get to my speech, Mr. Speaker. <laughs> um, uh, before, before, before you get to your substantive speech, um, Yamagra, um, no, no, no. the member. The... Yeah, just hold on. So I will, I will get to my speech, Mr. Speaker. But there's one other thing that somebody told me, and I ain't gonna tell you whether or not they come from PLP or FNM. I'm not gonna tell you this. But we stand in this house and talk about declaration. Look at the oil company. Exuma did the proper thing. He came, and the, and the Article 49 says, it doesn't speak of a cabinet minister. The member is disqualified of this house. If he is, it becomes interested, he doesn't tell. My good neighbor, Elizabeth, who I pray is successful in the next general election, came to this house. Simonet did the same. They recognized, just like Simonet, and he came here to do the same thing. And they nearly killed him. 
But the question I heard, Michael said something about the, yes, the construction of this company, where, where, which, which firm was involved in this company. Was there any declaration or disclosure? Is it required? Mum's the word. He's always quiet on things when he should be loud. He's always quiet on things when he should be loud. Point of order, um, the point of order for my Exuma. Chosen one. The chair recognizes Exuma Yamagro. Yamagro, the chair recognizes. Speaker, I, I, I would just caution the member for Yamagro that there appear to be some innuendo being uh, directed towards the leader of the opposition, and I would I would ask him to to be careful with this. Uh, point that he is on, uh, because unless he has some information to substantiate what he said, I think he is on a dangerous slippery slope. So I just caution him, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate your caution, you know. For all the things I've said about my good cousin, you didn't get up. You stood there, and you said you you sat there as quiet as a church mouse. You could hear a church mouse urinate on cotton. He was so quiet. But now he jumps up to say, be careful. I am being careful. That's why I said, is there a need? Carmichael came right here and made certain statements. As a matter of fact, Carmichael went on the same show that he was on saying that, oh, no, they don't respect me. So I didn't go to the meetings. The meetings to consider when we are in a pandemic. Kalani came, so let me just deal with that. That's why I said, is there a need for it? I didn't say it was a need for it. But these statements are being made in this house, and I can get the hand side and, and show it to you, and I can get a copy and send it to you, what Carmichael has said. Uh, but this, this is what I'm saying. This is the same man who goes on a show in the middle of a pandemic. And I, I was happy when you said, Kalani is working, I'm working, everybody must get to work, and that was in, just after Dorian. And we still need everybody to work to deal with COVID-19. Invited to a meeting with no less a person than Dr. Dal Regis and the strategic leaders to bring the Bahamas where, or to lead us out of this pandemic. And he said, sat right there, and said, he ain't coming. This was in the morning. So who tell me about meeting in the evening for this? We're in a crisis. We're in a crisis. And then, as faith would have it, when it came home, he decided to do the, 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 the live the, the, the lifestyle of the rich and famous. He goes to the US. He jet set. Papa gone in the hospital and say, come and tell the experts deal with him. When when Carmichael got COVID-19, you know what our leader told us? Go home and wait for the medical experts to call you. Take your test. When 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 Saudi Lutra was ill, let the medical professionals who are recognized as some of the best in the world deal with it. This man gone. Bush crack, man gone. My friend, South Andres, is big man, and he deserves better. And don't try, don't try, don't try to make him look stupid. Don't try to make him look stupid. Davis Forbes Sport was never in doubt. Anglison, be careful. <laughs> Davis Forbes Sport was never in doubt. Chosen one, sorry. Exuma, be careful. Davis Forbes Sport was never in doubt. And I say this with the greatest respect. And if she asks me to withdraw it, I'll take it back. Monique Penland, this is Monique Penland, be careful. That's big man. That's big man. With that, I take my break. And I will come back when we come back. God willing. <laughs> The chair recognizes the member for Bamboo Town. Bye, 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 Mr. Deputy. Yeah, that Deputy. Was good. That was good. Uh, God is up. <laughs> Your brother. <laughs> Your brother. It's, a, it's about time. <laughs> but, uh, Mr. Deputy, I do hope that the business of this house to suspend until 3 p.m. We will take our luncheon break and come back at 3 p.m. 
Man, the Alba Crow would probably deliver more of the fair. <laughs> we moved and seconded that this business that, that the business of this house suspends until three o'clock uh, this, this afternoon. As many members that are in favor remain seated, those opposing will rise. Right. Business of this house is suspended at three p.m. this afternoon.